Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blyton. This is Patch In, the show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. Let's get to the news and product information. Max MSP 6.18 is now out. Uh, the big, big thing about this is that the Gen object has been improved. Uh, it's more uh, quick to load, faster to respond, and best of all, it's now included free with Max. So if you're a Max user, this is a great reason to upgrade. Also, Max 7 has been announced and is scheduled for a release later this fall. Uh, there is some huge changes coming, according to Cycling74, including improvements to the patcher window, uh, the ability to save snippets of code while you're doing things and then just drag them into other projects. Uh, OpenGL has been uh, vastly improved for jitter objects, and now you can use Max for Live devices directly into Max. Um, but the big thing that I'm really excited about is that it has a massive change to the file browser, which was desperately in need of it. Plus, you can now do audio and video playlists. It'll probably be around 150 for the upgrade, uh, but if you're just buying into Max right now, you can get Max 6 for 20% off and get Max 7 as a free upgrade. So that is valid until Max 7 is available. So check it out. Nice. Every time I hear about uh, Gen, the Gen environment from Max, I, I always think of Gem from Pure Data and then get confused for a second and like, have to catch myself and stuff. But speaking of uh, our favorite rack emulation of gear pile of things uh reason eight has been announced and is accepting beta tester applications which could be really fun for reason users there's a huge workspace overhaul as well making it much easier to browse samples presets refills rack extensions drag and drop and and you can do all kinds of new things with drag and dropping to re create and re replace different elements um, yeah, and like I said, there's, the workflow has gotten huge changes. It comes out on September 30th, and the pricing will be similar to the Reason 7, about $400 full and, or 130 to upgrade. Cool. I am looking forward to that. I am a huge Reason fan. But more than that, I am also a fan of uh, Max MSP and Pure Data, which is great because today our guest is the one and only Miller S. Puckett, who created both Max and Pure Data. Um, of course, his bio speaks for itself, uh, but just the highlights beyond that. Uh, studied at MIT and is currently teaching at UCSD at the Center for Research in Computing and the Arts. So, Miller Puckett, thanks for joining. Uh, well, today. thanks for having me over. Wonderful. Um, Obviously, a lot of our viewers are going to be familiar with your work, uh, but for those who aren't, can you just give us a quick history of the development of Max MSP back when you were working at Earcom? All right, I'll do my best. It's, it's rather hard because that's, um, what, is, what is that, 25 years of history yeah, now? Right. It is. <laughs> um, so the original program, that um, the original Max, if you like, was my attempt to make it uh, easier to do musical productions at IRCOM, which is the research and production center in Paris, France that I was working at. So the, the birth of the thing was really um, uh, very frantic, fast programming between scheduled concerts. Mm -hmm. And these were nice high-profile concerts that were um, funded mostly by the government of France, um, uh, taking place in, in uh, hoity-toity venues with um, coat, people wearing coats and ties and all that kind of stuff. Uh, very much the classical music milieu. And, um, you know, the classical music scene in, in Europe is, sees itself as a sort of a continuous uh, developing musical scene that uh, has continued without a break since the, well, medieval times anyway. Uh, so that even when you hear crazy sounds coming out of speakers, the sort of, um, the sort of essentially the sort of etiquette that, by which you make music, you know, people sitting on stage facing the audience, uh, the idea that the audience uh, pays, you know, and, and uh, dresses well, and then all uh, then all is quiet during the concert, and you clap when the musicians come out. All that, all that classical music milieu was um, was all in place. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, we were making uh, these strange sounds. 
and apparently the concert going public in Europe is able to deal with this. They can they can sort of deal with the idea of uh, well, you know, you can go to a Beethoven concert or you can go to a Pierre Boulez concert, and they will uh, they will sound very different from each other, but they will sort of you know the contract the the what's going on between the listener and the musicians on stage is quite the same thing. Right. So, and to be fair, this was France. I mean, they had already had uh, Henri and Schaefer and Zanakis and all of those other composers there. Before. That's right. Uh, Paris, in particular, had been a hotbed of, of uh, new electronic music production at least since 1948, when Pierre Schaeffer and, and Pierre Henri started doing their their good stuff in the radio. Uh, the institution I was working at uh, was called IRCOM. It's actually uh, at the time was a bitter rival of the radio studio that Schaeffer had started, which in fact is still extant today, um, yeah. and is still putting on concerts of of, of what I call speaker music. Um, and IRCOM, uh, where I worked, was started by a, a composer and performer, Pierre Boulez, whose concern was much more about um, live music and finding ways to incorporate uh, electronic music techniques into live music performance. Right. Interesting. Now, along the lines of that, um, Max and PD have become almost the de facto languages for doing live performance. Uh, did you envision that it would take off to the extent that they have? Well, you know, everyone wants their, you know, everyone thinks that their idea is the sort of key idea that is going to make the universe click after they've uh, executed it. So, of course, I had grand schemes that, all right, I'm going to sort of make it possible now to do real-time electronic music. Um, but I don't think I had any reasonable um, any reasonable reason to think that it was going to be as successful as it's turned out to be. Um, and I guess the word success is really in terms of, um, of how it's, if you like, filled the market. In other words, the, the sort of uh, lingua franca now of, of patchable programming, um, programming languages for making real-time sound seems to be Max, MSP, and PD. Um, and I regard that as partly a, a question of circumstance and partly a question of just good old-fashioned hard work and, and, and vision. Uh, I certainly worked very hard on it and uh, wanted it to be successful, but uh, but it also didn't hurt that it was happening right in the uh, right in the middle of the essentially the world center of live electronic music, which was Earcom at the time. Uh, right. So when people wanted a graphical environment to use, they reached for for Max. You know, that was what was right there, and you know they could just go down the off go down to the next office and get me when something went wrong and so on like that. So it really had a leg up on on. Um, other kinds of, of platforms that were being proposed at the time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, of course, I was in a research environment that was full of smart people that I could bounce ideas off of. So the, the ideas ended up, you know, really getting shaken down and, and um, you know, the design ended up being, you know, better, I think, than the, than the other designs that were flying around at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, partly, partly because I was working hard, but partly also because I was in an environment that made it possible to really test and, and shake out ideas very well. Yeah. Now, um, on the subject of it being a patcher language, uh, that, to me, really helps to broaden the user base. Um, I can throw PD out in front of my students and get them up and running within an hour, uh, as opposed to if I have a language like Super Collider, uh, where they actually have to learn the syntax of a text-based language. Uh, was that just sort of a decision you made to help... Uh, expedite development or was it just because at that point the computers were finally able to handle doing uh, more of that graphical programming? Well, both of those things were true. Um, in fact, uh, the first versions of Max that I was making available around IRCOM wasn't graphical at all. You actually had to use a text terminal. There weren't graphical terminals that were, uh, that were in the production studios at the time. And so the only way that you could possibly describe networks was, was by writing them out in text. Ooh. And um, people didn't like it too much. <laughs> and furthermore, the the um, in in the original way that that it was working, you know, you would possibly have up to a hundred objects in in your in your patch, if I can call it a patch. I mean, the 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 whatever you say, the the con the concept of the thing was in fact um, an interconnected system of of things that talk to each other, even though you couldn't see it graphically. Right. But it really turned out that people needed to see the picture. <laughs> and um, and I guess in 1987 and 1988, uh, finally we got the first Macintoshes at, at IRCOM. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which were machines that allowed you to do bitmapped uh, graphical programming. And with a, you know, a, I believe a f screen that was five inches on the diagonal, that, um, you know, the little tiny oh, yeah. uh, workspace that you could work in. But finally, you could actually draw the picture that, that I was having to draw on blackboards to show people what they were doing before. And, um, well, it was, it was immensely popular to just be able to draw the thing and see what was happening. <laughs> it turned out to really make it useful in, in, ways, that, um, in ways that it hadn't been before. And, and, and the, now, the existence okay. of the graphical environment then changed the design pretty heavily because at that point it became possible to make much, much finer grained uh, patches. In other words, I was able to, to have more objects and have the objects themselves do much more simple elemental things than, than had been happening in the non-graphical version. So more and more of the, of the actual programming, more, more and more of the structure of the thing that you were trying to do musically was encoded in the picture instead of being encoded in, in the, the objects themselves in the way that it was originally the way I had it set up. Yeah. And I, I love looking at people's PD patches and getting like, and the, the quality of the programmer might, you can, you can see like how it functions, just seeing how it's laid out and stuff. Um, right, and you, you get some sense of what's important to people by looking at yeah. what kinds of uh, things they put in patches and how they organize them and, uh, and so on like that. Like some people are very, very fussy and very hierarchical in the way they think. Other people are much more, um, uh, much more egalitarian in, in the way they spread stuff around and, and, and make function happen in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, some people like their control panels to all be visible, so they make these huge front windows that have every possible control. <laughs> And other I am one hundred percent guilty of that. They need for the show, you know, just those those you know master volume ins and outs, mm -hmm. and uh, everything else is is hidden away until something goes wrong, and then you go in and open it. Yeah. I'm actually um, more uh, more in that camp. <laughs> I like to see volume controls and VU meters and a couple of indications of where things are. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's always a mix for me. Like I've got one of my pieces has just a big green button on the main thing and then you click on a sub patch and you and then you get the whole <laughs> everything yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and in pure data especially um the graphics are not as um efficient in runtime as they are in max msp and yeah. as a result it's actually really a good idea to try to keep the graphics out of sight when you're not using them because you, because your uh, your machine will just run faster that way yeah i found that uh back in may when i did my first uh PD patch for a uh, installation using a Raspberry Pi that oh, cool. I was <laughs> able to get so much better audio quality and latency out of it just by running everything from the command line after I had already created and tested the patch on my laptop. Yeah, that's I'm sure right. most can... of our nerd audience knows what, what Raspberry Pi is, Ben, but you might want to yes. explain that just briefly. Um, well, Funny you mention it. They just came out with a new model. Uh, it's the Raspberry Pi B 2.0 or something similar to that. I don't have the specs in front of me. Uh, it's a See, little I've got computer. One. Hang on a <laughs> yeah, it's about the size of a cell phone. Thirty-five bucks, and it's capable of running a full Linux distro off of an SD card uh, with couple usb ports you can add uh any type of sensors to it through the uh pins and use it to control installations or whatever else yeah i saw a kickstarter recently. yeah so some um I ha i'm friends with a foundation called new blankets which is actually in the uh, in the business or um, in the idea of lending out uh, pieces of very useful, powerful hardware to people who can do interesting stuff to them. Sorry, I'm making too much noise here. Oh, no, okay. Here's the here's the Raspberry Pi B plus. Uh, uh, thanks okay. to new blankets, um, you can buy these now, and I think they come in a couple of weeks when you order them. Um, the basic deal is, you pay thirty five dollars and you get this, which is a, a full on ARM based computer that can run uh, a version of Linux. Uh, which is called Raspbian, or at least the one I use is called Raspbian. I think there are five or six flavors now. And um, it has an audio output, a DV, what do you call it, HDMI video output, um, and it has pins whereby you can hook up uh, switches and even, I think, uh, continuous controllers of various kinds. So you can build this into, into pieces of hardware. You can get output from them too. Um, I'd better not. I'd better say I might be mistaken about this. I believe the whole thing dissipates one or two watts, depending on precisely which model you're using and what you're running on it, which means that you can run off batteries for quite a good while yeah. if you want to. You never have to worry about cooling. 
<laughs> and what else don't you have to worry about? Yeah, basically not a whole lot. And the other thing is uh, four USB lines uh, and one, um, I think, 100 megabit Ethernet port. I'm not quite yeah. sure of that. That, in fact, is what uh, eats the lion's share of the power is the USB and network controllers. And you can get a version without that that um, literally takes, I believe, a quarter of the power of, of, of this one. Yeah. The thing will run, uh, let's see... Uh, well, the thing will almost run pieces that I was running on two hundred thousand dollars worth of hardware at Earcom back when I was working there in nineteen eighty eight. So you can wow almost run uh, uh, some important repertory pieces of electronic music on this thing. Well, and that brings me to uh, kind of the issue of scalability of PD uh, in particular. Um, I know that LibPD, the core of it, has been ported to every possible platform under the sun um i've got a version of it running on my cell phone under the pd droid party software um and i know that a lot of people use it on pc mac linux uh everything um it's it's just an amazing environment because it is so portable and yeah that's, when you did um, it it was like you said two hundred thousand dollars worth of hardware, and now you can do it on a cell phone right yeah we we all knew that that was going to happen, although different people took uh different people went in different ways with that information so even at m i t when I was an undergraduate, um you know there were a lot of people who were studying computer science quite seriously, and uh you know Richard Stallman was there that that sort yeah. of that sort of people and um there was a very strong um emphasis being placed just by people you would talked to on the street at MIT about how the uh, software uh, had to be constructed in a way that could withstand the constant um, upheaval in operating systems and in computer hardware. So even at that time, the the idea of of writing a program that would be able to run in 30 years' time in in some radically different kind of situation was was something that was on everyone's mind. And um, I went into writing pure data. You know, it was my perhaps sixth attempt at writing a real-time computer music language. Uh, and so I had learned a lot of hard lessons by that point. And absolutely one of the very, very most important things that I was trying to do was write a piece of code that, would, um, that could withstand all the buffetings of, of the changes of, of practice in time. Right. Um, there's, a, there's a fallacy out there, which is that computer, that, that um, everything that you do in, on a computer is going to change and become obsolete. And... I think the truth is that certain kinds of things become obsolete and certain kinds of things just become enshrined forever, like the ASCII character set, the QWERTY keyboard, um, and now the C programming language, uh, the uh, POSIX uh, system calls and so on like that. Certain things freeze, and those are the things that you can count on, and you can write a program using those things, and they will last uh, essentially forever now, I think. And uh, other things like... Um, well, anything that anything that's in contention, anything that, that there's a tug of war over uh, as to whether it's it's going to be a standard or taken taken over by something else, those things are, are are you know are not safe. They might just disappear because they might get overthrown by something else. And in particular, proprietary things are much more likely to get overthrown than open source things, um, for the simple reason that the open source things get copied a lot, and then people need them because they've got you know they've, they've built dependencies of them, and so. Right. So people, you know, people have to make um, make things compatible with these open source things because they already exist, and other people are leaning on them. So if you find those things, um, then you can actually write a, you can write yourself a system that will essentially last forever. Yeah. And I now remember, on oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, on the subject of open source. Um, yeah, that is one of the big differences between Max and PD is that Max is proprietary. And PD is not. Um, what was the thought process in making that open source? Um, well, uh, several things happened. Um, the, the most important thing was that uh, I found myself in a situation where I couldn't actually contribute code to, um, at, uh, to Max MSP. Mm-hmm. Uh, this would have been around 1996 and 1997. I could actually, you know, I could have my own private copy of, of um, Earcom's version of the signal processing Max. I'm not sure, but I think uh, Max MSP as a, as a trade name didn't come out until, I forget, 98 or 99, so, something like that. 
It was, uh, so long before so, that happened, yeah. there were um, there were signal processing versions of Macs running around at IRCOM, but for licensing reasons, um, I wasn't able to distribute them because well, they belonged to IRCOM. So I could do anything that I wanted to with that code, but then there was no guarantee that it would ever see light of day because I didn't have control over the distribution. Mm. So the only possible way that I could actually uh, make code that I could distribute or that I could be sure would be distributed was to simply start all over again and write a whole new program. Mm. So I did that. And then the question is, well, okay, you're, you're writing a new program. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to compete with Max uh, or are you going to just do something else? And the answer for a couple of reasons was just to do something else. First off, Max was uh, was doing its own thing very, very well. And so I didn't want to like make a competitor with it. Um, and the other thing is that um, at that time, in say 96, the, the web was was existing. And so you actually had a um, you had an avenue whereby you could distribute software that didn't require that you put physical packages in a, in a store. Yeah. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to, to set up a whole company in order to, to shrink wrap CDs? Or actually, I think they were floppies at the time, but shrink wrap floppy disks and put them in physical stores where people would buy things? You know, you're talking, you're talking I don't know what, but man years of work setting things like that up. Or are you just going to say no and put the thing out for free? Uh, the answer for me was to say no and put the thing out for free for the simple reason that I knew that 90% of the effort of, of putting the thing out as a, as a commercial product was going to be the, the work of commercializing it as opposed to the work of coding it. And I didn't want to do that. You know, I was a professor. I <laughs> had other things to do with my time and start a company. So, um, uh, so I, pref- I decided to do only 10% of the work and just write the thing and, and uh, let it take care of itself in terms of distribution. And then a lot of people have taken off with it. Uh, you talked about how when something is open source, it becomes essential even to uh, the distribution of whatever Linux distro or program that uses it. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the PD extended version. But right. have you seen any additions to... Uh, the PD code through extended or external objects that have just absolutely uh, blown you away with what people have done with this. <laughs> well, the first thing was uh, getting it ported to Linux. You know, I didn't, I wasn't running on Linux at the outset. I was running on IRIX, which was an SGI. Oh, SGI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the second platform was Windows, which of course had horrible, you know, latency problems and all kinds of things like that. Oh, it still uh, does. And, <laughs> Uh, finally, some people in Graz, Austria, at the Institute for Electronic Music there, uh, headed up by Winfried Rich, um, made a PD port to Linux. They just downloaded the code, ported it to Linux, and then um, Winfried actually showed up here in California and said, hey, watch, watch PD run on Linux. And it was um, this would have been, I don't know, 98 or something like that. Um, uh, it was unbelievable. Like the whole idea that you could actually get audio into and out of Linux uh, almost mm-hmm. required um, almost required wizardry in and of itself. Like I spent a couple of years learning how to get audio reliably to go in and out of Linux boxes. At that point, yeah. At the, now it's kind of easy, but in the day it was like, oh, you're going to do that. And and um, another amazing thing happened. Well, Jim, the uh, mm. Mark Danks his graphical environment for multimedia, which used to be the graphical environment for Max, by the way. Jim, this is not very well known. Jim originally ran in Max on an SGI machine, and uh, got ported over to PD because it was looking like that was going to be a better way to distribute it, <laughs> which, wow. which it turned out to be. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, that was uh, that was something. I always knew that graphics was going to be important, but um, I didn't see how I was going to find time to learn how to, to make a whole graphics, uh, um, you know, input and output and, and subsystem for uh, for PD. And there, someone else just came in and did it. In fact, several people have done it in different ways, but Jim is the one that's the most widely used now. Yeah. I've, I've been trying to get in. I've spent a lot of time with Jim. Really soft, Nate. That, spent a lot of time in Jam and done different pieces with it, but um, I've been getting into grid flow lately. It's an interesting Oh, yeah. Grid flow is a cool one. Yeah. And... Um, and I have a confession to make. Uh, I had to do some graphics coding, and it turned out to work out better for me to just talk directly to OpenGL. <laughs> so I ended up 
um, I ended up making externs that just did my own OpenGL uh, path, pathway without using Jim at all for various complicated reasons that I better not get into right now. <laughs> well, when, when you have those tools at your disposal, of, of really accessing the hardware that way, it's amazing. Um, yeah, you can do amazing things. I, uh, you, you touched on something earlier with uh, um, talking about making software or computer-based work that would last through the ages and things. And I, I know I've, I've done a little bit of research on your PED repertory project. Um, is, is, is that still going? What, or is, is that still a <laughs> Oh, gosh, yeah. It's the next thing on my do list after getting PD-46 out. Okay. And right now, I'm just in the middle of getting PD-46 out, and cool. I just hit another snag yesterday, so oh, <laughs> it's rats. not quite ready to go. I can't figure out how to get uh, how to get it to. Um, I can't figure out how to get a single compile image of PD to work with or without Jack installed. Um, just, oh, just stupid! And and PD Extended does it, so uh, so I know there's a way to do it. I have to learn how PD Extended does it and imitate that. I think. Um, <laughs> Anyway, that's a snag. Um, one hit snags. Anyway, after all those snags are done, then I'm going back and, and doing an overhaul. Not an overhaul, but doing a rev on the PD repertory project. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't turn out to be as um, it didn't turn out to be what I thought it was going to be at the outset. So my original plan was to um, accrete a real collection of, of a couple of dozen maybe pieces of, of iconic electronic music mm -hmm. um, in in essentially realizable form. Uh, but it turned out that the music that I could get access to was mostly the music of people who I was working with. <laughs> and so it turns out to have a lot of stuff by Rand Steiger and, and Philippe Mannery and a little bit of stuff by Pierre Boulez, uh, yeah. but, it's not a, um, but it's not a good representative collection of electronic music in, um, um, in general at this point. So I think oh. I need to find a different name for it. Well, I will also, shamelessly uh, donate all of my PD code to that project if yeah, you're right. interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that causes another. That's another thing, which is how to do the librarianship and upkeep of the thing. Right. So it, it seemed reasonable to do. Um, it seemed reasonable to do things that I could fit into a very specific mold. Um, you know, a very specific kind of patch templates so that everything would look alike, so that I would sort of know how to start things up and, and know how to debug things when they went wrong. But it, it didn't work to turn it into a sort of open source project that that would invite a whole bunch of other. Uh, other kinds of music or other kinds of ways of, of realizing music because then I wouldn't be able to maintain it. So, um, so really it's not a PD repertory project at all. It's sort of my favorite PD pieces. And the other thing is that other people have, have caught onto this idea of, of preserving electronic music in, in stable patches. And so if you go looking at other places, you'll find, um, uh, uh, other, um, probably better attempts at, at, at making libraries of, of, uh, performable computer music than the PD repertory project. Yeah, so I, no, I think it was the only thing of its kind when I started it, but I think at this point it's been overtaken by much, uh, much, much more effective and successful attempts. Yeah, I I know a couple people who have done that kind of work, and I've I've made a patch for a piece that uh, Theo Musgraves Narcissus that has got like I've gotten a couple different emails from people of, of like them asking for the patch to be able to perform it and stuff. And so cool. It's, yeah, it's nice I actually did a realization of that piece with a couple of musicians once. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, it, 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 and I've heard of so many different uh, coders doing doing a version, their own version of that, and it, yeah. it's fun. Yeah, and, and Pierre Boulez's piece, Dialogue de l'Ombre Double, the Dialogue of the Double Shadow, is my translation of the title. Uh, there's another one where people just just make their own patch. They yeah, think it's yeah. going to be easy, and, and that particular piece is kind of hard to get it right. No. So you will frequently yeah. find you listen to people's realizations of it and say, "Well, you know, should it really sound like that?" Hmm, <laughs> not sure. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll admit I I made a, a patch of that one as well for one of my one of my oh, friends. Cool. Um, and yeah, I I don't know if the recording is released, and I I don't know how to find out whether it was sounded okay, but we'll see. <laughs> it's a it's a bear to put it on. Well, you know you know what what kind of a bear it is. It's, yeah, it's a lot of work. Files and all this stuff. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was a it was it was a good old time. Um, and uh, and I, I I can't imagine a, a better person to talk to about this where. Um, like go, as I was going through school, I spent so much time coding and so much time um, just like digging into Linux or like and getting a lot of help from Ben in that way as well. Um, and the balance between that and practicing viola and writing music, 
and and uh, and spending time coding and learning things about math and different programming languages, it was it was always tricky for me to strike that balance. And um, I understand you that you've uh, you've spoken to this balance uh, in a number of different uh, lectures and different things like that. Um, I was wondering what what your attitude was with that, or if uh, how how do you strike a balance between? I know you've got a PhD in mathematics while also being a a uh, computer music professor. What, what's that all like for you? Well, the truth is, um, I think a lot about it, but I don't actually have any control over uh, over what happens to me <laughs> in terms of, of what I spend my time doing. Um, in a couple of respects, one is that I'm I'm always responding to external events. Um, so, so for instance, you know, Max was all about uh, oh, well, we're going to premiere this uh, piece of piano music. And the premiere date is, you know, July, blah, blah, 1988. So yeah. what are you going to do about it? <laughs> you know, and um, that's basically been what's happened to me, you know, since almost since I was a student at MIT. Um, I think, and the other thing is that I don't have a whole lot of self-control. So I end up just sort of doing whatever, um, whatever gets stuck in my head as being the, the next thing that I'm fascinated by. And... Um, in some ways, that's a good strategy. So, you know, I, I worked on, you know, I, I did pure mathematics for the first, whatever, 20 years of my life, you know, obsessively. Mm-hmm. And did computer music, you know, did computer music coding obsessively for many, many years, like decades. Um, I also get involved, you know, in, in, in music productions, although never really as the instigator of a music production. I'm not not one of these people who have, have an artistic vision that just has to out, you know, I I, um, I find projects that people are working on that seem cool and, 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 and important and, and compelling to me, and then I join them. Mm-hmm. And um, that makes it a lot easier for me because I don't have to sort of second-guess myself as to whether what I'm doing really makes any difference or not. It's, it's, it's someone else's, you know, someone else's uh, um, success or failure. And, and me, I'm, I'm just a person who's having fun being part of the party. Yeah, you know, yeah, like you know, yeah. like the like like a hired musician in a band, something like that. Mm-hmm. Get to be the good engineer and build the software that'll play the part. And, and, and do the, right, and exactly. Do that role. So the so the actual software development that I do is is some is now some sort of balance or imbalance between oh, uh, there's a piece going on and I have to have this ready or that ready. And then the other aspect of it is, oh, there's this uh, thing that I want to be able to do, this research project that I'm now fascinated by. Recently, it's been delay networks, like m- making nonlinear reverberators has been. Oh, nice. So, yeah. oh, yeah, we, this is a thing that nobody really knows how to think about is what, what happens when, you, when reverberators go nonlinear linear in their internals and how can you use those nonlinearities to make cool sounds, right? Oh, and so now, you know, I'm in a position where, okay, I'm trying to get this goddamn PD release out, but... In fact, what my brain is doing is messing with matrices and <laughs> and um, trying to think about what am I going to try next time I actually have some time to, to patch some sound. Man, so is that going to make a future appearance in an updated version of the theory and technique of electronic music? or It might. I've actually got a couple of writing projects that I'm probably going to let theory and technique sit. And um, uh, at some point, what I want to do is write a... Um, write a thing, I don't know if it would be a book, but it would be book size, that would essentially be deep excursions into into half a dozen or maybe a dozen different kinds of, of, of families of techniques. One of which okay. would be you know, nonlinear delay networks, um, one of which would be phase bashing, you know, t- taking yeah. uh, taking waveforms and, and, and taking control of the phases of the sounds and the things that you can do with that. Uh, one of them would be my guitar project. Um, one of them would be some uh, would be um, uh, some techniques that I've put into a new uh, piece of Fleet Manneries that came out uh, a year ago. Cool. Actually, well, uh, could you could you tell us a little bit more about your guitar project? I saw a, a couple of video clips online, but I'm curious to hear more about what what's going on with that. Well, it depends on how deep you want to get into it. Um, <laughs> let's see. I'm going to probably jolt the microphone a couple of times, so this is going to make uh, some bad noises. Just to warn you. Um, okay. Okay. Here, here it is. This is totally unplanned, but a thing that I've discovered is that if I don't have the guitar right where I can grab it, then I tend not to get, not, not to play it. And the most important thing about a guitar is remembering that you're supposed to, you're supposed to practice the thing every day so that you can actually play it reasonably. 
Yeah, keep the fingers moving. That's a, that's right, a right. thing. So the guitar is this. Um, the yeah. the basic deal is, well, it's just a regular old guitar. It's, it's actually a Steinberger, but yeah. um, that's only so that I can get it on airplanes. And then the cool thing is <laughs> I put a pickup on it that's a six-channel pickup that Roland makes. It's running right along the, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get, get a good frame, running right yeah. along the bridge of the guitar. Mm -hmm. And then you, um, then with that, your computer gets a six-channel audio signal that has the six guitar strings coming in separately. Yeah. yeah. And then you can do stuff. <laughs> um, what, what Roland thought of doing with that was um, uh, making a guitar synthesizer so that what you would do is you would pitch an amplitude track all the six strings and then put any kind of synthetic sound that you wanted to on the, on the result. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've been doing is, is using the uh, individual strings um, as wave shaping inputs. So what you can do is you, um, if, if you think about what, an, uh, what anything that oscillates does, well, it, it goes through some kind of waveform and then it repeats it uh, approximately yeah. the same, although, of course, the waveform changes as the, as the sound evolves. Mm -hmm. right. So what you can do is you can look at the waveform and you can actually deduce um, how the, uh, where you are in the waveform. And what that does is that gives you, um, that gives you a phase, a, a thing that goes from zero to one and, and does so repeatedly every, every cycle of the string. And then you can use that directly to, uh, to inject into any kind of computer music instrument that you want that's based on oscillators. So you can take, you can take that waveform out and put your own waveform in. And the result is not a sampler. What the result is is, is essentially a synthesizer. You, know, you, can, you can do you know, the classical waveforms like sawtooth and, and square wave, or you can do additive synthesis or whatever it is that you want. And the, and the guitar is playing the synthesizer in the sense that everything you do to the strings is is an audio signal that comes out, but the audio signal has essentially been changed into a different timbre, and so the result is essentially essentially a kind of a multi timbre guitar. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I know. I've uh, like in Pro Tools land, I've heard of uh, the process of like replacing drums, where like you've you got like a whole drum kit and you take each track and replace each bass drum hit with a sample of a bass drum or something like that. Right. And it seems like this is kind of what you're doing on a wave level. That's right. So what I'm doing is doing that, but doing that on a level of, of milliseconds. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a lot of fun. I could give you a demo, but I'm not sure how deeply we want to get into it. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I, I guess we've, we've got some available I, I, uh, online. Um, well, that's I, true. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, but it's, yeah, we'll it's links. It, yeah, thank you for showing that. And that's uh, those Steinberger guitars are super cool as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're lovely. No yeah. that stock and all this. Stuff. Well, and so are those Roland Variax pickups too. Oh yeah, yep. they're, yeah, they're good. <laughs> oh, you got my patch. That's, from, that's, from, that's yeah. from Ableton's Twitter feed. Yes. Oh, it's come out. Wonderful. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. Yeah, just just got some news on this recently. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, I'm actually looking to see if if the things that I do actually show up on the web. I just assume that some of them will and some of them won't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just did a did a demo for Ableton uh, of of this about a month ago in Berlin. Yeah, and they did a two camera shoot and and were very you know very careful about trying to record it well. So I think they um, <laughs> you might get a pretty good representation of what it was. Oh, yeah, nice. I don't know if the video is out. This is just a photo they posted on Twitter. Ah, okay. So we'll we'll definitely link to that if it's available though. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's um well it's it's great to see and it's interesting um like we've talked to a couple different people about different interface design and uh and pd for me and all of my work with working with different interfaces has been the core of it and it's interesting to see you talk about building uh, a different kind of i guess it's like a whole instrument built in um for the software end of it, are you using something like PD as the sound generating core for the guitar instrument? Well, it's essentially a, a six-channel guitar effects pedal, in a way. In other words, it's uh, the, the sound of the guitar is moving transparently through the computer with you know like ten millisecond latency, and then yeah. the computer is basically doing this waveform re replacement trick, but it's doing yeah. it really directly on the audio signal. Okay, cool. Well, nice, and. Um, I've, uh, I was wondering if we could hear a little bit about, um, so like you've, you've built all this software and you've, uh, we've heard about the, the different projects that you have going, but you're also an active professor and teacher as well. 
um, doing, and I've, I've heard some good things about the, your program, the Center for Research in Computing and the Arts. Could you tell us a little bit about what's going on in your program? Or? I can, yeah, I can try to. Um, one little bit of nomenclature: there, there's no longer any such entity as the Center for Computer oh. Center for Research and Computing in the Arts. The Sorry. webpage is still sitting up there because I because nobody knows how to take it down. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a mistake. Sorry, someone lost the server no passwords. The director of the Center for Research and Computing in the Arts. Something else has happened, which is that the music department at, at the University of California, San Diego, now has a, a new music building that has mm-hmm. laboratories for doing electronic music in all sorts of ways, and so. In a lot of in a lot of ways, you, um, the uh, what's happening now is uh, in the music department is supplanted what used to happen at the Center for Research and Computing in the Arts, which was a, like a thirty year old institution, but uh, but it sort of you know gradually went the way of all institutions that um, uh, you know it sort of morphed. Uh, it's now uh, what what it was is now part of the Qualcomm Institute. Okay. And one can go over there and work too, but uh, musicians aren't there in such numbers as they used to be, and so I've found that. The, the good place to work right now is just in, in the regular old music department at the University of California. And there, there's a, um, there's a, uh, there are four graduate programs in performance, composition, uh, integrative studies, which is essentially um, experimental musics, and, um, and computer music, which is taught as a, as a research field. And so I teach in the computer music program directly, but um, I'm also teaching in the other three. So people who study composition or performance uh, can work with me, you know, just working on electronic music issues of one sort or another. And, uh, and there's an undergraduate program called the uh, Interdisciplinary Computing and the Arts major. Um, so we see something like 100 undergraduates go through every year. 100 new ones. So there's a, I forget what, what size the program is, but so we're giving undergraduate classes um, in essentially the techniques, both of electronic music using pure data and other things like that, but also, um, uh, also recording and production. We're, mm-hmm. we're teaching increasingly that kind of thing. Um, I'm, te- I'm teaching in the program, mostly electronic music technique. We have Tom Erb, who's the author of SoundHack who is yes. sort of doing half and half. He's teaching recording, which he, he's also an expert at, um, but is also um, teaching some computer music technique. Okay. And then we have um, two uh, people who are more research-oriented, um, um, Tamara Smith, who's an acoustician, and um, uh, Shlomo Dubnov, who's a computer scientist. So uh, it's not really a, a program just for straight-up electronic music musicians. It's more a program for people who want to know what's inside the tools and 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 be able to do you know be able to hack as well as to make art. Interesting. Yeah, and and I know that hacking is is developed into quite an industry in the music world as well. Yeah, yeah it really has. Um, it, it just turns out that if you can make your own sounds, you can get stuff that you can't necessarily get if you use other people's sounds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so right. why not learn to do that? <laughs> Well, and not just the sounds anymore. Now it's also the hardware, as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interfaces, and yeah. and also uh, ways of organizing things musically. So yeah. more and more, it's 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 interesting now to uh, consider the possibility of music not just as a thing which is performed on an instrument or written out in ink and paper, but the, all the things in between there, where computer algorithms are actually actively uh, helping make musical decisions or suggesting musical material. That's a okay. that's a big and growing field now. I I haven't uh, delved into artificial intelligence too much, but I know that PD has got a lot of resources in that, just with the the capacity to do math. <laughs> and, and yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, I'm not even sure what artificial intelligence is. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, the, uh, people at MIT were eventually saying, "Yeah, I actually believe in natural stupidity." Is the antidote for artificial <laughs> intelligence. But, uh, but a lot of people are doing things which they call learning algorithms. They avoid the word AI because that sounds like Marvin Minsky and Department of Defense. But um, yeah. things that can uh, try to organize incoming patterns into, into groups and, and classify things that are happening in, uh, in order to sort of allow decision making to, to follow in, in, in less, in less push buttony but more sort of organic ways from what's happening in a live performance or starting to get important and interesting. Mm-hmm. Right. And David Cope has been experimenting with that for years as well. Uh, many, many years. Yeah. And then I remember um, at a symposium I was at, I want to say it was in Toronto. Uh, they had a lot of people talking about similar things and using uh, Lua networks to create learning algorithms in uh, 
quite a few different programming languages. It was really interesting, but most of it, uh, the math just went so far over my head, I couldn't follow half of the discussion. Yeah, and it's it's not just one thing. It's splintered. There are, there are, I don't know, dozens of different whole classes of techniques that people use for different kinds of problems. So it's it's almost impossible for someone to 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 really know an overview of the learning algorithm menu out there right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I was wondering, um, and kind of related to this of like the the new things that people are doing. I uh, if I had somebody that I could ask about who what what might be like an exciting new thing or like a new direction in computer music research or something. I, I can't think of a better person to ask than you. <laughs> um, I, do you, is there anything like in the programs that you're a part of or, or things that you've heard about that like seems like an exciting new direction that people are going in with, with computer music or, or um, have anything on your radar? Yeah. Like? Well, this will sound a little too specific, but I think, um, People are now realizing that there are there's a huge um, what's the right word there, there are huge possibilities just in picking up the physical vibrations of real objects, um, mm. which could be musical instruments, but could other but could just be things that you touch. That um, for instance, you could imagine putting contact microphones on a surface, and then you would touch the surface, and it would it would be able to hear through the microphones where your finger was and where it was moving, and furthermore, how hard it was scratching or pressing or tapping or whatnot. So the idea of making, if you like making computer interfaces, but um, but essentially allowing computers to gather acoustical information um, in a spatially detailed way about how uh, physical objects, both both solids and, and the air, are vibrating, mm-hmm. I think is a is a very uh, very cool research area right now. I am yeah. absolutely kicking myself because there was a Kickstarter project related to this that I saw that I cannot remember the name of it to save my life right now. <laughs> Yeah, I've, to... I've seen at least one. Someone I think wants to make some sort of a mouse-like thing with a uh, with a flat pad, but I can't remember what it was or that was it. Like that. Interesting. Well, um, I'll have to search for it and oh. include it in the show notes or something. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in making in making percussion instruments. You know, like like hard um, hard small objects that that uh, vibrate, but then they're kind of dry. Interested in 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 hooking them up with microphones and trying to uh, basically do a sound transplant on them and use them as controllers for other kinds of things. Cool. Yeah. It, that would I be mean, one example. Yeah. You get really different kind of input, like uh, in, in isolating the dry tone of these small objects. That sounds like, yeah. 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 Sounds and like the voice, you know, is the, the voice is probably the best musical controller we've got out there and people have no idea how to use it yet. <laughs> right? Like you would think, in fact, I've thought for decades that, Oh, gee, all you would have to do is just sort of plot the instantaneous timbre of vocal output on a few dimensions, like maybe uh, amplitude and, and fundamental frequency and a couple of formats or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then you would have a multidimensional joystick, right? All you would do is you would, you know, you just make any sound that you wanted to with your mouth, and then it would just be a point in some space that, that you mapped it to, and then you would use that to control a synthesizer, right? Interesting. Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, we we mentioned this before the show, but I think Ben and I both got into Pure Data right around the time that you came and did a performance with Philippe Bonnery at Michigan State. It was in 2004, 2005. But I remember you talking about the the PD patch that you had for one of those pieces that where there was a vocalist singing into a microphone, and I think it it did something like what you're describing, uh, or at um, least the core of it. The where piece right. was on echo, I believe. Yes, and it was Juliana Snapper singing. Yeah. It. Yep. Uh, in fact, I've been working with Juliana ever since. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, she's one of my main collaborators right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, and we're still working on the idea. But that, the, the thing that was happening in that piece was that it was doing a live uh, linear predictive coding analysis of, of her voice, trying to, trying to find the resonances, trying to find the, the resonant frequencies of her vocal cavity to, to use those essentially as filters on, on another kind of sound that's being made in real time. So she'd be able to make sounds, well, just sing, because she's a trained singer. And the, essentially the resonances of her voice would become also the resonances of some of the electronic sounds at the same time. Yeah, um, I, re- I remember that now, and it was, it was a wonderful effect and quite striking. Um, yeah, so I, I guess, uh, so it, it's exciting to hear that you're still working with her. And, uh, and it sounds like you've got um, a, a bunch of different things <laughs> going on. The, uh, 
What what are I guess do you do you have any other pieces coming up that you're working on or or different? <laughs> well, yeah, the most recent thing was that she and I collaborated on a piece which we called Lipsity, which was for a full dome projection system here in San Diego. So we actually got into um, graphics. What we did was we took her lips and essentially blue screened them off of her face. Wow! She, she painted okay. her lips blue so that we could separate them uh, in color space. And then we had this essentially talking galaxy, pretending it was a cosmology show, but but with the, wow. the cosmos talking back to the announcer kind of thing. Uh, and we're now trying to develop that into a full-length show that um, we hope to be able to put on next spring um, in Montreal. Okay. Um, but that's, you know, it's in the planning stages right now. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll look forward to news about that. Um, yeah, I guess... Thank you so much for joining us and, uh, and, and going through this whole process. Ben, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Um, well, no, just uh, thanks for being on. And are there any future developments for PD that we should be on the lookout for? Ooh. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, right now I'm, right now I'm in, a, in a situation where I think it's more important to... Um, it's most important to sort of deal with some long-standing things that don't work terribly well and get them working better. Mm-hmm. Um, this this particular release that I'm coming out with, maybe the most important thing is it's kind of stupid sounding, but it remembers devices by name instead of by number. So that when you mm-hmm. plug or unplug oh, USB oh. devices, it doesn't uh, forget which is which. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's just it's stupid, but... <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's built sort of into my setup sort of every time. Yeah, yeah like, that would be... Yeah. And um, and I think the next year or two is going to be kind of usability issue level things like that. Interesting. Well, it's you've you've been doing such an honorable thing for the world of computer music, developing PD, and I know that Ben and I have both uh, uh, our so much of our work has been generated from your work, and so thank you, <laughs> first of all, well. for that, and uh, and thanks for coming on the show and. Uh, um, if you if if you have anything coming up, uh, I guess we'll we'll keep an eye out, and uh, we're gonna have everything that we talked about, little bits of it, in the show notes um, as as we do it. But I believe we're we're brought to the end of our our program and uh, our last segment. That every month we right. do this two minute challenge. And appropriately, yeah, I'm eager to hear about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And appropriately, we have about two minutes left on the show. So, Nate, I believe you're up this month. What are you going to talk about? Well, I'm going to... One time before, I believe I talked about uh, LFOs and different kinds of uses of oscillators and stuff. I'm going to take another stab at another component of synthesizers and, I guess, other things. But this one's going to be all about envelope generators. You ready for this? Yeah, I thought, and Miller Pocket, thanks again for our overlay is, <laughs> is, a, is a fun <laughs> a PD a patch. PD patch with a green canvas that I can key out. Yeah. All right. <laughs> fun. You ready, Nate? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Hit it. So, say in the synthesizer you start with a tone, something like, bah. it's oscillating, it's doing what it does, if you, but we want something that's not just like a tone, you want to make some other musical elements, say like a drum that can go like, bah, have a sharp attack and go down, or like a string that goes, wow, and different things like that. This, for that kind of thing, you need to dr- be able to either draw a shape or have something that would control the amplitude of your sound. And em- envelope generators are a perfect thing for that. A classic ca- type of envelope generator that had, uh, has been developed and used in synthesizers all over <laughs> and, and for all time is this ADSR, an envelope generator. And ADSR, those four letters that stand for attack, decay, sustain, and release. And um, basically, the, these are four different stages. Or like you would, you would <laughs> say on your note uh, on your keyboard that you would press, you would give a, a, an indication that you want to start the note. You would go through the attack phase, come down the decay, and then sustain. And that's where it holds until you lift off your key, and then it goes into the release phase. I've been reading about uh, how these are 
put together in terms of like a synthesizer and the hardware and everything. And it's an interesting collection of capacitors and resistors and um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't think I have time to go into it, but um, in the analog land, those things are all connected in uh, in ramps because it's these voltages going back and forth. Um, and I squeeze in these uh, envelope generators can be good for uh, doing amplitude, but also doing pitch, like pew, for a, like a kick drum or something like that, or a filter, like wow. There you yeah, go. Two generators. minutes. It's, All right. <laughs> yeah, I always have so much trouble with these, but thank you for <laughs> listening. <And> I, <laughs> what did you, you guys think you did all right? Touched on some things, at least. Yeah, yeah I mean, you said what it was. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm used to spending like a couple of hours talking about envelope generators, so I don't know what I would do yeah. in two minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, well... I, mean, I didn't want to take this one part, because part of I, the conceit not, is that it's impossible. That's yeah, why right. it's fun. So we we all fumble through <laughs> it. Ben does an amazing job, and so we can't can't wait to see Ben do it next month. And we'll, we're all <laughs> waiting to see what he might choose. But oh um, yeah, I'm going to do Fourier transforms and yeah. Oh, transforms. perfect. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> two exactly. minutes. It's going to be brilliant. <laughs> Don't hold me to that. <laughs> yeah. Still on the list sometime is to build a contact mic in two minutes as, as a task, and we'll see if we oh. we manage to get through that. But um, but anyway, uh, thanks again so much for coming on the show, uh, Miller. And uh, do you do you have any last minute plugs you'd like to do of anything coming up that we might be oh, able to? No, I've sort of said it all. But thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a it's been a great time uh, talking to you two and getting to know you a little bit now. Finally, after whatever that was, ten years that we haven't seen each other. I suppose that's right. Yeah. Well, yes. And yeah, very generous with your time, and uh, and it's great to hear some of your insights uh, and getting into a little bit more detail. Um, I think that about wraps it up for this month's patch in. Uh, patch in is part of the SoundNotion.tv network, and you can check out our shows at SoundNotion.tv/pi. That's also where we'll have different uh, our show notes, where we ha have links to each of the things that we talked about and kind of the, the layout of the episode laid out. Um, you can also check out our uh, show in like iTunes Store um, or wherever, whatever podcatchers you might use. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again. Uh, my or, and you can support our shows uh, on the Sound Notion Network and Patch in particular by uh, either do we've got spaces for donations on the website or you can go to we've got a special little amazon affiliate little search thing and so if you if you go and buy the thing you were going to buy on amazon anyway but get to it through our search thing then we get a little bit of a kickback it'll be really nice so um check that out if you if you have time or if there's anything you wanted to get um and uh but thanks again this has been a uh, patch in for the month of august my name's nate blighton i'm ben Furman, and thanks again we'll see you next month